the title of the song was Don't Talk, Don't Talk About My Sin. And the, some of the lines were, you can make your sermon funny. <laughs> you can make your sermon funny. You can make your sermon funny and I'll give you lots of money. Just don't talk about my sin. <laughs> <laughs> Remember back when we were doing 1st and 2nd Samuel and Kings, there was times we were covering four chapters in a night, and I couldn't even find one application, you know? And then when we went and did the Book of Romans, we'd do four verses in a night, and I'd have to pick from ten applications, right? So what's going on right now is it, it feels like this. It feels like the first three quarters of the Book of Acts, we had so much new ground to cover. I mean, we have this... Messiah that has come, right? And he has fulfilled the law, but he's a completely unexpected Messiah. I mean, in terms of what he expected, what he accomplished. And then he sends Paul, and well, first the apostles, and then Paul out to evangelize. And as soon as they start evangelizing, problems arise, unexpected conflicts. What about things like the law and circumcision and Gentiles and feast days and wait a minute, how does this work? And so every time we hit one of those issues, we had these great discussions on some deep things like, you know, grace and, and ceremonial things and baptism and the Lord's Supper in place of Passover, all these things. But we're kind of in mop-up time here, you know, it's basically Paul on his way um, to prison and various interaction with characters along the way. So, um, so tonight's going to be very narrative. So let me just sort of um, breeze through the review right now. Um, um, this, uh, by the way, Paul, you know, they talk about three different missionary journeys. And I've been thinking about it this week, and I'm calling this the fourth missionary journey. You ready for this? It was the missionary journey back to Jerusalem, like one last shot. I'm going to go back because it wasn't just to the Jews. The fact of him going, I think, to the temple shows that he really thought, hey, I'm going to give these guys one more shot. Because think about it, you know, if he can convert, and I use that terminology loosely, you're aware of that, right? The Sanhedrin, think about that. I think in Paul's heart, based on Romans 9, 10, and 11, he kind of, I think in his heart is thinking, Let's bring all of Israel in, into the kingdom of Christ. I mean all of Israel, like the, everybody at the temple, like maybe if I just go, right, and share Christ. Anyways, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Um, the, um, it looks like some of the um, Jews from Ephesus came down uh, and purposely tried to cause trouble for him and slander him. Uh, they caused a riot. Paul is actually rescued by a Roman commander who thinks he's an Egyptian cult leader, which that's interesting. Paul's an interesting guy. Um, but then he speaks educated Greek to the commander. And then, of course, he requests to speak to the crowd. Um, and they freak out when he talks about bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. So again, they try to kill him. And then uh, right before he gets flogged, um, Paul reveals that he is actually a Roman citizen. And everybody's like, whoa, 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 hands off that guy or whatever. Um, and so um, they, uh, they bring him in front of the Sanhedrin where Paul, of course, you know, smartly divides them with ideas about the resurrection, uh, which, of course, was harder for the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And um, by the way, we didn't really discuss this much last week, but I think it's worth covering again. Uh, it's interesting how successful Paul is to bring the, Fa the Pharisees, or at least some of them, over to his side. I mean, it's kind of interesting. They end up sort of defending Paul. Remember they say, you know, maybe it was an angel that spoke to him. And I got to thinking about that this week and yesterday in particular, particularly. And um, that I think there's a possibility that some of those guys might have eventually um, received Christ. And I know I've brought this up a few times over the course of the book of Acts. But again, I'm going to bring it up perhaps one last time tonight, and that is um, we get so accustomed to um, the enemies of the gospel who are Jewish as being referred to as the Jews that we forget how many of them were being converted all along the way, including two different episodes where we see 
um, the Pharisees themselves getting converted. And so I'm going to just quickly um, review two of them. One is uh, from Acts uh, f- chapter 15, verse 5. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up to give their opinion about Gentiles being circumcised. So here we have a party of Pharisees who are believers like Paul. And um, also some uh, in John, John chapter 12, you know, which is even before the resurrection, um, it says, yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders of the Jewish faith, believed in him and believed the testimony of Christ. So I always find that really interesting. Um, so then, um, the, of course, oh, did I leave all this part out? Uh, they drag him down to, um, oh no, he hasn't gone down to, uh, sister. okay, no, that's, we're gonna, we're gonna just stop, uh, right there. Uh, it ends up with God visiting Paul, uh, at the end of, um, um, where did we end up at 2312, I think, yeah. Um, and the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage as you've testified about me in Jerusalem, you must also testify in Rome. Okay, and so this is going to now set up tonight where uh, Paul's going to end up down in Caesarea. I confuse myself with the way I worded my own notes here. Where he's going to be for at least two years in Caesarea. Okay, so, um, so let's pick it up. It begins with a plot against Paul's life in chapter 23, verse 12. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commanders to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case, and we are ready to kill him before he gets there. Dun, 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 dun. I wonder how, how hungry those guys got before they broke their vow, you know? I mean, it just makes you curious. Now, um, I was curious about this because it says the Jews formed a conspiracy. And I was curious if it was the Pharisees or the Sadducees or perhaps it was both. Um, but I'm guessing more likely it was uh, the Sadducees. And maybe even this is causing division in the, you know, the Sanhedrin group. Um, it's kind of a, a big effort on their part, by the way. I, I want to point out, even though I, you know, I, I jokingly said, well, they must have got pretty hungry. Uh, and somewhere along the line, either they starved to death or they broke their vow, right? But I also want to point out that it is no small thing to an attempt an assassination by a guy who is being guarded by Roman soldiers because he's a Roman citizen. My guess is, had they had an, had an, uh, an opportunity to actually do this, it might have actually resulted in the deaths of quite a few of them, if not all of them, because the Romans would not have been amused at an assassination attempt of a Roman prisoner under their guard, okay? However, as you're probably aware, that doesn't take place because Paul doesn't die here at this point. So we pick up the story in verse 16. This is interesting. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul, Then Paul called um, one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. Then the centurion said, "Um, uh, Paul the prisoner sent, wait, the centurion said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it you want to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now waiting for your consent to their request. Now, this is interesting. Here's a tantalizing little factoid about Paul here. Right? Paul had a sister? (laughs) Paul's sister had a son? Paul had a nephew? Why is the nephew in Jerusalem? Well, I know we all love to speculate. And by the way, all commentators like to speculate as well. So um, some have speculated that, you know, Paul had family still back in Tarsus. And it was likely that they had sent the nephew perhaps to Jerusalem to study. I mean, maybe that was... 
you know, a Pharisee to be, which of course leads us to wonder, did he come under the teaching of the church? Was he a believer? Did he, what was his relationship with Paul, you know, his nephew, who clearly has Paul's best interest in line? Um, however, unfortunately, for some of you that are waiting for me to answer these questions, nobody really <laughs> seems to know. Now, a lot of people have speculated it sounds like he was really young at this point because of the way that the commander takes him by the hand and leads him. It sounds like he's perhaps, you know, a 10 or 12 year old boy who's sort of intimidated in the circumstances of being in a Roman barracks. And he's basically there to Lorraine's point, um, be somewhat of a traitor to the, um, to the Pharisees if, in fact, he is sort of a Pharisee or religious ruler in training, yeah? So, um, yeah, very, very likely was really young. Um, but the commander seems to get the uh, message loud and clear. Um, uh, I, oh, I forgot to read verse 22, sorry. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers I know, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix, okay? Now, yeah. does it feel like a little overkill to you yeah. there? Yeah, what, I added up, is it 470? Somebody do the math, is that right? Yeah, 470. The only thing I can think of, and by the way, we're going to find out later in the story, not all 470 go with them all the way to Caesarea. They're going to go a certain ways and then uh, leave them just with the Calvary. But I think it's kind of interesting because I think it plays a little bit into some other things that happen in the story tonight. And that is um, the great emphasis upon which these Roman soldiers put on keeping the peace. And you sort of get this sense, don't you, from this episode and an episode that's going to come up a little bit later in tonight's story, that you don't want to get called back to Rome because you couldn't keep the peace, right? Or you couldn't, I mean, that seemed like the number one priority of the Roman Empire is keep the peace. We don't want uprisings. We don't want riots. Um, you know, we don't want things happening out of our control, right? Keep control. And so, I mean, that was cool that Lewis started chuckling as I started reading out because it's totally overkill. Like, you know, but they were like, we, we, this guy's command is dependent, right, on him getting that. And by the way, many have speculated that the whole reason he wanted to get Paul down to Caesarea is so he could wash his hands of them. He's clearly causing riots and, um, you know, excitement and, you know, trouble. He, get this guy out of my realm, because once he gets him down to Caesarea, he'll be somebody else's problem, right? Kirk? Great way to keep the pieces overwhelming force. Yeah, overwhelming force. Shock and awe. Shock and awe, right, yeah, overwhelming force, yeah. By the way, this apparently is half the garrison. So he like said, we'll take half of our garrison, half the dudes. And by the way, we'll be leaving at nine o'clock tonight. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I just had a weird visual of the monkeys in the Wizard of Oz, you know, everybody, everybody. <laughs> Um, okay, by the way, it is a, uh, yeah, journey, it's a journey of 60 miles, leave at once, 470 guys, there we go, yeah. Um, Paul, Paul is too much paperwork for the commander. Yeah, Paul, yeah, Paul is too much paperwork, yeah. By the way, you know, I, I wrote this down, and I should have brought it up before we move on to the next thing, but one of the things I think that backs up this idea of overwhelming force to have no problems is I was almost sort of surprised that maybe they didn't do a sort of a reverse ambush, so to speak. Oh, we'll show these guys. Let's pretend like we're taking Paul the prisoner, only we'll catch these guys. So I thought of that, and then I thought, no, they don't want any more trouble. Like the bottom line is they don't want to kill these 40 religious Jews who are, you know what, they don't want, they don't even want that much trouble, even though with a thousand guys, 
they could have clearly pulled off a reverse ambush and, you know. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Anyway. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they should have waited four or five days. Yeah. I, don't think, I thought about that too, Lorraine. Wouldn't everybody know? Wouldn't make the newspaper? My, yeah. But my, my thinking is, we don't, know, does it say, we don't have any idea what time of day it was when Paul's nephew gets there. But I'm gonna okay, guess. Day, so but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna guess they're like, okay, rally the troops. We're out of here in four hours or whatever. And by then it would be too late. You know, 470 guys going out of the gate. You know, no one's gonna be like, oh, let's attack now. So right. Okay. So now this is interesting because um, the guy writes a letter as follows, which sort of begs the question: How did Luke get a hold of the letter? But I read, because I wondered that today when I was looking at it, but I read a really, really interesting and likely thing. Because doesn't it make you go, yeah, wait a minute. How in the heck did Luke get a hold of a copy of that letter? You ready for this? Here's a really great explanation. Very, very likely the letter was read aloud at Paul's trial. And somebody was there writing down what was going on, or at least listening. And so at the very least... Um, Luke had talked to an eyewitness who at least, at the very least, heard the letter being read out loud, and it might be a bit of a paraphrase. But I thought that was pretty good, because I don't know about you, but I wonder about things like that. Never even thought about it. How yeah. Would How would you got the letter? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, so here's, here's what we have. Um, this is from uh, the Roman uh, commander guy, Claudius Lysias. To His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. Yeah, okay, you guys caught that, right? Okay, we'll come back to that, right? I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law. But there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. So when I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So like I rescued a Roman citizen yeah. when, in fact, we know he was getting ready to flog him. Yeah. <laughs> he kind of left that part out, didn't he? Yeah. Isn't that funny? The poli the politics, uh, boy, nothing's changed, isn't it? It just it really, people, people looking out to save their own skin. And by the way, that might be a theme that I didn't write down as an application for tonight's, but it comes up again and again all through tonight's story. People protecting their territory and saving their own um, skin. And uh, I want to know why they're accusing him. I brought him, I brought him to the Sanhedrin, and I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law but there was no charge against him that deserved death. He had actually been accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple, which is worthy of a death sentence. That is a desecration of the temple. For whatever reason, either Claudius wasn't paying attention at that part or decided to just ignore it and let the Sanhedrin come down because he didn't want to deal with a capital offense, right? So, um, well, there were no witnesses for that anyway. No, but he doesn't mention it. He says some little thing about their law. But look what he says here. No charge against him that deserved death, which technically, if the, the charge laid against him was blasphemy and desecration of the temple, technically would have been a, a, a charge worthy of death, but he doesn't want to deal with it um, but would, would that, that wouldn't stand in Roman law anyway. Uh, no, not in Roman law, but the Jews did have the right, from what I understood, to put someone to death for desecrating the temple. Well, he's a Roman. Uh, now, that's a, see, he doesn't want to deal with this. Correct, yeah. And, and, and by the way, I, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not arguing with you on that point because now Paul's a Roman. You know, no, that's a really good question. If a Roman Gentile entered into the temple, could he be put to death? Dun, dun, dun. In any case, my, my main point, I think, stands. Claudius doesn't want to deal with this. Like, he's like, you, you take him, right? So um, away, away they go. Verse 31. So the soldiers, carrying out their orders, took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. Does that mean anti-father? <laughs> right? 
No, I don't think Patrus is fine. That looks like it. Anyways, antipasta, whatever. <laughs> the next day, they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks, okay? And when the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. Learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. So um, 35 miles uh, overnight from 9 p.m., however long it took him to get to Antipatris, a good distance of marching. Um, they figured, I guess, at that point they had a good enough lead on 40 hungry guys. Uh, so the cavalry can go on from there. And, um, uh, oh, by the way, because Paul was from Cilicia, then Felix then would be responsible to give him a full trial because of his Roman citizenship coming from Tarsus, yeah. Uh, by the way, Felix is an interesting guy. I went and read his history today, but I will confess to you, I read the Wikipedia history, so take it with a grain of salt, right? <laughs> um, but it's the short, quick one. Uh, but it's interesting. He apparently came from a family of Greeks that had royalty in their blood. But they, when they were, you know, subjugated by Rome, they had sort of lost all their privilege. But Felix had a really smart brother by the name of Pallas, P-A-L-L-A-S, who was a really smart dude, and he weaseled his way into the court of uh, whoever it was before Nero. I have, sorry, I have forgotten who the Caesar, reigning Caesar, Tiberius? No, I don't remember, sorry. I, I read it today and I forgot. Um, but in any case, because of that, he elevated Pallas' whole family, including... Um, Felix. And then on top of that, Felix is a real social climber um, because he ends up ditching his first wife for um, Drusilla, who is a granddaughter of King Herod, and then eventually apparently ditches her for the granddaughter of Antony and Cleopatra. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, because he's trying to climb the ropes, but it doesn't end up going well for him, but that's a bit of a plot spoiler, so let's keep the story going. Yeah, so what I read was he was servile, whether that meant a slave, and the reason why I didn't use the word slave when I gave that description is because in Rome, under Roman law, there were sort of different levels of slavery, you could technically be a slave and be almost operating like a CEO executive running, running a guy's business. Does that make sense, you know? And the way they described um, Felix's slavery, I, I didn't get the sense that he was a slave like, you know, cleaning out the stables type of slave, but was sort of subjugated under Rome and not having full Roman, so not a freed man. Does that make sense? So... Do with that as you may. I've just given you the Wikipedia version of that. Um, and for all I know, for all I know, he was a galley slave. But I just didn't get that sense. You get the sense that he was educated and da-da-da. And that's why they gave him a full province to rule. Uh, not likely they would have pulled a guy out of the stables and put him in charge of a province. So, um, but, but yeah, uh, I, I even think that that, that title slave could, could work, actually. Yeah. By the way... Um, he only ruled Judea for eight years, and everybody hated him. He was uh, ruthless and cruel and heavy-handed with the Jews, and the Jews hated him, which is why he got recalled eventually. But sorry, plot spoiler, we got a little ahead of the story there. Okay, so they, they called, you can tell how narrative this is, right? I mean, have we even hit one theological? No. Nothing yet. It's just, his, it's like history. So we're going to just keep moving. So let's, um, let's pick up the story in chapter 24. Do the first nine verses. Okay, five days later. Oh yeah, we, or I'm sorry. I, I, you're right. I skipped that. He kept in a guard in Herod's palace. By the way, so the palace was built by Herod the original, Herod the Great, the builder, who pretty much is pre before Christ who builds the temple, right? And, uh, but now the Roman governor is living in Herod's palace, yeah. So five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer. 
named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you. <laughs> What's that old saying? How do you know when a lawyer is lying? Yeah, he opens his mouth. Here we go. Okay. And your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He's a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we are bringing against him. And the Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. Isn't this almost comical? He begins with this flowery language and, you know, flat out lying flattery. They hated Felix. And by the way, when I say they hated Felix, this is based on historical writings of Josephus and stuff. He, they reviled him, which is why he gets called back to Rome, because they're like, you're an idiot. You're way too heavy handed. You have completely alienated the Jews. They want to rebel and they yank him out of there. So this is this guy's straight up lying. OK, um, troublemaker, by the way, is a key word. This uh, lawyer, he's not stupid. It is a word that um, that borders on treason. OK, so. He's, he's, bearing, he's being very subtle, and what's the word, subliminal? Like, this guy is treasonous, because again, as Lewis pointed out, he's a Roman citizen, but what's the one thing that can get you killed even when you're a Roman citizen? Is to be a traitor to Rome. So he's undermining, he's very shrewd what he's doing here, yeah? And a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. What a great title that is, yeah? And... Um, it's interesting that so much attention is going to Nazareth. Now, um, scholars reckon that that term Nazarene sect was at this stage in the game, because we're at about, what, 20, 25 years after Christ, right, is a slur against Christians, right? So Christians seem to call themselves what? Followers of the way. The way. way. Followers of the way. Their enemies refer to them as the Nazarene sect. And perhaps one of the reasons why is because Nazareth was sort of this backwater village, which even was it Nathan that says, you know, can anything good come out of Nazareth, right? So what he, look what he's doing. He says, this traitor, right, who is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. He's very subliminally cutting down and undermining any kind of authority or any kind of um, promotion Paul might have for himself. Um, but the final charge to the Jews would have been the most serious and attempt to, to profane the temple. Um, so he says, so he says, we seized him, which again is not true. They didn't really seize him. They were actually in the actual act of trying to kill him when the Roman guard pulled him out of a riot and saved his life, okay? Now, by the way, I, one of those things where I'm like, wait a minute, I don't remember this before. Um, but who'd like to read verse seven? Just kidding. They've taken verse seven out of the Bible. <laughs> okay, so uh, the NIV life application, bless their hearts. Uh, they, um, they, yeah, so let me just read you what it says about it. I, these are those little curious things that I really enjoy, but um, this is what the NIV life application Bible says about it. Some manuscripts um, um, him and wanted to judge him according to the law but the, some of the earliest manuscripts don't have this. Um, but the commander, Lysias, came and with the use of much force snatched him from our hands and ordered his accusers to come before you. So, so what's that? Bad move. Bad move, right, yeah. Oh so, um, so apparently er, the earliest manuscripts don't have that verse in there. So it gets yanked out of the Bible. 
Which, by the way, I love that kind of stuff because to me it shows the integrity of the people that we, right, put our trust in to bring us the most accurate um, text that we have from the ancient texts. And I love the great humility of a publisher who says, hey, by the way, just so you know, these verses aren't in the earliest manuscripts, so do with that as you may, so to speak. Like basically the whole last part of uh, the book of Mark, there's a whole bu big chunk in there uh, that is not in um, the earliest manuscripts. But I, I kind of enjoy that kind of stuff. All right, well, let's move on. Uh, tenth, uh, when the governor motioned for, oh, so, okay, so now we get to hear from Paul. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you've been judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. Notice the difference in his <laughs> introduction there, yeah? Where's the flattery? None. He basically just states a fact. You've been a judge. All right. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago, I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anybody at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogue or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges that they are now making against me. So I love the fact that he opens his thing way less flattering than Tertullus. In fact, not flattering at all. But he also makes a good point that he never set out to debate or argue or cause trouble at the temple, right? And so we pick it up in verse uh, 14. However, I admit, and this is cool. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Now, this is really interesting. He gives sort of a brief statement of faith. First of all, notice how he, he aligns himself with the Jews Oh, I'm totally on board with all this stuff, the law. I, I worship God as a member of the way, which is a really interesting way, I think, to sort of put that all as a follower of Christ who fully believes in the law. I mean, that's really interesting. Um, you know, Jews who become believers consider themselves to be what? Completed Jews, right? Completed Jews. And Paul... I don't know if that's what he meant to do with that little statement right there. Um, but I, I think it's cool that all his beliefs are in line with the law, which is really cool. Then he says this really interesting point here. Um, I have the same hope in God as these men, which of course makes me wonder when he's talking about the resurrection, if there was any Sadducees there. I don't know. You get the sense these are Pharisees, not Sadducees. I don't know. But then look what he says. It is concerning the resurrection. Uh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, he says the resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Now keep that in mind because a little verse is going to come up a little bit later tonight. I'll be honest, I had breezed past this when I was preparing and I got to the end of my studies earlier this morning and I thought, ooh, I missed that. And so I went back. So I kind of, you know, if you're an underliner or a highlighter or something, that would be a line to highlight or underline right there. The resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. This is apparently the first instance we have of Paul mentioning a resurrection of the wicked. And what does he mean by that? Just stick around for the next 20 minutes. We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> Verse 17. Now, after an absence, by the way, this is Paul still talking. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonial clean when they found me in the temple doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia. Where from? Ephesus, right? who ought to be here before you to bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, unless it was, remember I did this on Sunday, this one thing, right? Yeah. I shout as I stood in their presence, it is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. So, um, 
Now this collection was both to be an offering to God to give also apparently at the temple as well as to help struggling Messianic Jews as a peace offering from the Gentiles. Paul states he'd done nothing wrong in Jerusalem and if the, Ephes- if the Ephesian Jews had a problem, well, they ought to be there presenting their own case. Um, so then again, he's like, well, since he's not causing trouble, let's talk about resurrection. And um, uh, I would say, Tom, that at this point, he's distancing himself from political issues. And let's, let's get to the heart of the matter. Let's get into the theology of this. Like, let's, let's get the theological thing going here. So... Verse 22, then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, why? Well, probably because of his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jew, you know, whose, it would be her, oh my gosh, her great uncle, I guess it were, that, Herod the Great? Herod, yeah, Herod, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm confusing myself and it's not important. Granddaughter of Herod the Great or whatever. Um, anyways, um, so Felix, who's well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. And he ordered the um, centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. So I, it's hard for us to imagine what exactly that looked like, but it sounds fairly benign. And by the way, who would be coming to his needs, do you think? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Uh, Cornelius and uh, was it Philip? Philip was there, right? Cornelius. Cornelius and Philip were there running the church at Caesarea. Yeah. Um, so that's just something to kind of think about. So Felix seems to be sort of reading the situation well. Um, he was familiar, familiar with what's going on. Now, there's no record of Lysias ever coming down and testifying. Um, it's likely Felix saw that the charges against Paul were bogus. Um, he might shrewdly be attempting to like sort of just let the situation settle or go away. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I, I wrote in my notes, maybe it was just a stall tactic, hoping that the Sanhedrin would get frustrated and just go back to Jerusalem, you know? And uh, if, if it was a stall tactic, uh, apparently it worked because it goes on for about two years, but we haven't quite got there yet. Um, By the way, uh, Tom, I have in my notes right now that it was during this two-year period that Nero has become uh, Caesar, yeah? And Felix is already unpopular and in trouble with Rome, so perhaps he's thinking by doing nothing at all might be the safest thing to do. Um, And he's stuck between protecting a Roman citizen but not wanting any more trouble from the Jews. So if he can just kind of call a stalemate, what does he care if Paul is stuck in prison for two years? But we're not quite there. Let's read the last few verses, and then we can just talk it out. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. And as Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, underline that, Felix was afraid and said, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. (laughs) At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. And when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Okay, so Drusilla is an interesting person. The youngest daughter of Herod, um, married off the first time to the king of Emesa, who was in kind of an under king of Syria, but apparently was very beautiful. And when she's only 16 years old, Festus actually kind of steals her um, away, um, doing some underhanded conniving, which would have made her very unpopular um, with the uh, Sanhedrin because it would have been illegal for her to divorce her husband to go over to um, Felix. And um, she, they reckon she's about 20 years old when this takes place. And just because these fun facts I find interesting, her first son that she had with Felix died at the age of 20. Are you ready for this? In the eruption at Pompeii. Wow. Just one of those funny little factoids of history that... 
I don't know why that's interesting, but I was interested, and you apparently were as well. Um, okay, now to me, when I read this, Paul talks about what? Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Now, this is interesting because normally it feels like when we talk about the resurrection of the dead, we talk about it, and I mean up to this point in the book of Acts is what I mean, in a very positive light, right? Like, you know, the Pharisees believed in a resurrection because they believed in clearly something after this life. And the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they don't. But now we have a really interesting twist, don't we, on this? That there will be a resurrection of even the wicked, but they will face judgment. And apparently, Paul gets through to Felix on this because he doesn't want to hear about it anymore, right? Um, this is getting too personal. I don't want to hear about like what I might face after um, I die. It must have been really unsettling to this because think about, think about the irony of I'm imagining what happens. So bear with me. This is just me imagining it, right? But who's the one who's supposed to be on trial? <laughs> right? Are you with me on this? And Paul starts talking to him about hmm, righteousness and self-control and a judgment to come. Who's on trial now? Interesting. Which is perhaps why Felix didn't want to hear any more about this. And yet he keeps calling Paul, hoping to maybe get a, a bribe or something. Um, some have speculated that uh, maybe Paul could appeal to the church to bail him out, or perhaps some have speculated that Paul's dad had some bucks. But in any case, Felix doesn't want to hear that he might be on trial. He liked it better the other way around. Um, and then so Felix gets replaced by Festus, but this is after two years, and then strife apparently breaks out in Caesarea, between Jews and Gentiles, and Felix responds harshly against the Jews. This is, by the way, from the history that we have. Um, he gets recalled, and um, apparently he was in danger of actually being punished and imprisoned in Rome. But by this point, Paulus, has, his older brother, has become connected with Nero, and instead he kind of goes into just sort of a humiliated retirement, right? Now, it's interesting, he could have possibly pardoned Paul before leaving, but perhaps he didn't because he didn't want to cause any more trouble with the Jews because that's why he got recalled um, anyways. And apparently the new circumstances are not going to be favorable to Paul because Festus apparently doesn't have any knowledge about the way. He's like fresh from Rome going, okay, what's going on? Who's this guy? Right? Some prisoner that left got left behind by Felix. And that's going to, of course, lead us into next week's teaching where Festus is like, well, bring this guy. I want to hear what this guy has to say. Why, why, we, why do we have a Roman citizen in jail? Um, which, again, you know, when he appeals to um, get Agrippa, yeah, he's like, there's some dead guy named Jesus, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, we'll get to that um, next week. Um, so uh, I, don't know, I don't know what to do with all of that, with application for tonight. I mean, one of the things I thought is how little has changed um, when it comes to the enemies of the gospel. Uh, first, they begin with false accusations and a twisting of what we believe or, or what have you. Yeah. And, and then um, sort of a, a persecution, but then also don't talk to me about judgment, right? And my sin and the sort of the offensiveness of the first part of the gospel, which is all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, I imagine it, actually, I don't know about this point. I know we've discussed this before, but I forgot again. Has Paul written to Corinth at this time? The letter, of, or did he write the letter Corinthians from Rome? I forget. Son of a gun. Okay, anyways. Anyways, so let me let me bring this up to modern day um, 
modern day thing, and I was thinking, and this is maybe a really lame example, but it's the first thing I thought of today. But you know, we have people out there right now that are distorting the truths of Christianity and who we are and what we believe as a way to sort of shout us out so we won't what? Talk about their sin and their need for Christ, right? And I thought there was a really interesting one that I sort of was dying to bring up and never had a good excuse to do it, but it was so hilariously ironic that it goes to show you that I think the lengths people will go to in their attempt to sort of discredit Christianity without actually doing the math. And that was, um, do you remember a few months ago when they were getting ready to um, name Amy Barrett as the new Supreme Court Justice, right? And what was their big beef with her? That she was a Christian, right? And so here's the great irony. They have women out in front of the courthouse protesting and they're wearing the, the costume from that TV series, The Handmaid's Tale or whatever, which if you don't know anything about it, let me explain. It is a futuristic dystopian um, novel and now TV series where these sort of quasi-Christian fundamentalists have subjugated women to uh, only exist for the purpose of breeding. Okay, are you with me on this? So this is sort of like a enemy of the gospel's fantasy about what Christians really want, right? Which is to subjugate women. Now, do you not see the irony of what they were protesting? Because the woman they were the woman they were protesting happened to be probably the most uber example of an achieving woman I could think of. She has just been elevated to the highest court on the planet Earth, right? Also happens to be a mother of seven children, including two adopted kids from Haiti and a handicapped one, and she does all of that. And they're protesting because they think she is going to subjugate women. Do you understand the lengths people go to to sort of discredit who we are, what we stand for? And, and I hope what you see through the book of Acts is how empowering the gospel is to women. And we've seen it all through the book of Acts. These strong, powerful women, business women who are supporting and promoting the gospel. And yet, I'm just gonna say it, our enemies want to flat out lie about who they think we are or what they want us, they want other people to think who we are and they don't know us at all. And by the way, it works. I mean, it works. They have deceived millions of people who believe uh, this weird form of Christianity that is, I'm just going to say, unrecognizable in this room right here, you know? And, you know, let's be honest, sometimes they go out and they find the couple of wackadoodles or whatever that, yeah, you know, and they put them on Larry King. And here, and here you know, this is, this is representative of, of Christ and Christianity. Yeah. Anyways, I thought, I thought of that when I was re reading all of this. They're making all these outlandish claims about Paul, you know, and Paul's like, actually, that didn't happen. <laughs> None of what they said happened. I went up to, to for a purifi purification thing, and people flipped out. You know. Okay. So that was that was the one thing. The other thing I thought that hasn't changed is um, there used to be an old uh, country Christian song. Remember that green tape? Uh, it was called uh, from the Big Eye, and the, the title of the song was "Don't Talk, <laughs> Don't Talk About My Sin." And the, some of the lines were, "You can make your sermon funny." <laughs> You can make your sermon funny. You can make your sermon funny and I'll give you lots of money. Just don't talk about my sin. <laughs> <laughs> that was the lyrics of the song, yeah? And um, sorry if I've told this story too many times, but it, it bears telling again was when I was sharing Christ with my younger sister and um, she finally said, hey, Dan, you know, we're going to go for it. My husband and I, we decided we're going to go to this church next Sunday. I just thought you should know. And I was like, yeah, that's great. What did you pick? She said, Calvary. I think it was Calvary Coast, North Coast Calvary, San Diego, which I happen to know is a great church. And I've been there a few times since, you know. 
Yeah, great, great. So, you know, I'm like praying all week, you know, God, you know that. So finally, Sunday afternoon rolls around, and I'm like, I didn't want to call right away, but I couldn't help myself. So I call, hey, you know, sis, how you doing? Da, da, da. Did you guys go to church today? She's like, yeah. She goes, I don't think we're ever going to go back to that church. I go, oh, no, that's not what I wanted to hear. And, of course, what I wanted to hear, she went forward and got saved, right? She goes, Kent, I don't know, like the pastor was on some kind of trip or something, but when I left there, I didn't even feel good about myself. <laughs> and I'm like, you should definitely go back to that church. Yes. And let, let me explain some stuff. But I'm like, please go back to that church, you know? And it's really true. You know, honestly, I don't sit and prepare sermons hoping that you'll all leave here feeling crappy about yourself. That's not my point, right? But we don't parade out of here, I hope. I hope nobody ever parades out of here thinking that they have achieved righteousness through their own efforts, that they are okay and good with God, right? And that they somehow think that upon the resurrection of the dead, they're going to be like, hey, God, yep, you know, you and me like this, yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm your guy. No, we should leave here in great humility and great joy that God has found favor on sinners like us. Amen? Yeah? So that's, what, that's about the only thing I could think of to sort of give some application, you know, when, when Felix is like, eh, la, 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 don't, talk, don't talk to me anymore about judgment and sin or whatever, because Paul didn't make him feel good about himself, right? It seems like it, doesn't it, Steve? I mean, I don't know that we would ever have enough information to know, but it sounds like, no, you know what? I, I don't know. Trying to figure out the mind of Paul. I was about to say, it seems like maybe he's rather enjoy. I mean, see, Caesarea is beautiful. <laughs> and you sort of get the feeling he's, you know, not in chains or whatever. He's having opportunities to meet with Felix. But I have a sneaking suspicion that the Paul I know, <laughs> like I know him, wants to either A, get to Rome, or B, um, wants to start preaching the gospel again, you know? Now, there is the possibility, and by the way, it's a really good question, Steve. You're a smart guy. It's a good question. I'm not totally surprised. Something I had thought about, like, he's being attended to by at least Philip, Cornelius, and who is, there was a woman there, too, at that church, too. I can't remember who now. Is he teaching? You know how, like, he was fellowshipping with the churches at Ephesus and teaching till late in the night, Josh, you know, I mean, are, you know, is, is, you know, is Paul meeting with the church and breaking bread on a regular basis? Probably. I, my guess is, yeah, you know, I mean, that seems to be his modus operandi. and boy, the guy is not shy because we're at, we're out of time and we went real narrative, long, long section today. Um, but I, we've only got, I think two more, uh, teachings on Acts, maybe three, I lost count here, but only two more, and then uh, we will do the book of... Okay, let's pray. <laughs> Father God, <laughs> th <laughs> Father God, thank you for this night, Lord. Thank you for your servant, Paul. Uh, Father God, I, I just, without doing that classic thing where as you pray, you summarize the teaching thing, sorry, but Father, I love your servant, Paul, who it seems like in every episode that we read through the entire book of Acts, anytime he gets an opening to talk, what does he talk about? You and the salvation that is available through you. And in the face of false accusations, Lord, he just talks about you. And so, Father, I, I pray, Lord, let, let us be inspired by that, God, and the things that we talk about. Um, our responses to the accusations against your church and your gospel and your body. Um, may we be slow to defend ourselves, but quick to give the reason for the hope that is within us, God, um, like, like your servant Peter wrote. Uh, let us be quick to give that hope for the reason we have in us, and that is you, and um, coming for sinners like us. Just grateful for that, God. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, we'll really begin kind of picking up the pace again next week and wrapping up in, I think, just two weeks or so. Mm -hmm.